So this is Professor Ndibisi Ekekwe, CEO, Fast Micro. And as our CEO, he also represents the courage and the audacity of African enterprise as Africapitalism. Welcome him and get ready to have your mind reorganized. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm Amdubisi Ekekwe. It's quite a, a very great privilege for me to have this opportunity to speak before you on this capacity. Uh, this is Lagos. It's a very beautiful city. I'm so excited to be here, to come here to share with you my own entrepreneurial journey. And I do believe vividly that we can also learn something as we share to make a very, very beautiful African continent. But let me begin by congratulating every one of you for what you have achieved to have made this thus far to become an African entrepreneur as we look for that momentum to build a lofty aspiration for the African continent. You know, if you move from the lagoons of Lagos to the, ma to the mangrove of South Africa, and if you move through the beautiful plains of East Africa to the grasslands across Central Africa to the mountains of the beautiful Northern Africa, you will see the aspirations of our people looking for hope, looking for opportunity that these African young people can actually offer a new vision. I'll be discussing today about extending the frontiers of what you do. You already have a vision. You already have a company you are running. But how can you take it to the next level? How can you build a business that has what we call scalable advantage? How can you build something that other people can connect in that vision to build a business that will help to make a better Africa? You know, as a young man, when I was in the university, in Federal University of Technology, I learned something. I had an opportunity one day to meet the vice chancellor of my university. I written an article in a foreign magazine, and he called me. He asked me a question. Why did you do that? I said, sir, I was feeling that there was a live opportunity ahead of me, even though I was taught in a university in Nigeria. That by having the capacity to connect at the global stage, it can also open me to the opportunities that are ahead of me. He said, I'm very proud of you. And I'm do believe, I do believe vividly that you will have that opportunity to excel it. But I will start by asking you a question today. Why are we entrepreneurs? Why are we business people? What is the essence of business? Because uh, if we can answer that question, that is also how we can actually understand why we need to extend the frontier of what we do. We are entrepreneurs because market is not perfect. The process of buying and selling, the system of demand and supply, that system is not necessarily perfect. So there is a friction in the marketplace. And because of that friction, we need to have entrepreneurs that can fix that friction so that the process of demand and supply can work. If I have $100 here with me, and I can spare that $100 for one year, I may say, I need to give it to somebody who will pay me 10% as an interest rate. And I also have to find someone who can also be ready to take that $100 and pay me that interest rate. Most times, it's not that easy. But because it's not easy for me to find that person, and for that person to also find me, we have a need for a bank. So what a bank does is that a bank comes in to solve that friction that exists between myself and the other person looking for that money I have. And once the bank does that, the bank has to earn a fee for doing that. As you started your business, you had a vision. You have the capacity that you can do something. You have this encapsulation that there is a friction in a specific sector of the market where you can go in and remove and dissolve and melt that friction. And when you melt that friction, the market rewards you for providing a service. And that is why you have a company. And now you have a company and you have a vision. The next question is, how do you accumulate capability to have the capacity, to have the competence, to have the kind of bravado to actually run that business. 
The process of accumulation of capability has to be, what is it that interests me? What is it that I want to do? What is that market opportunity that is in the market? I remember the day I spoke with my vice chancellor. That was the first time I was before a very rich man, a very big person, because uh, you don't usually see vice chancellors in Nigeria in face to face. They are special people. <laughs> so I asked these questions. It's really very possible that one can see them. I said, I will hope one day I will build a business where I'll have opportunity of actually meeting some of the leading business leaders of our time. I said, I was going to work. I'm going to study. I'm going to do a lot of academic work. So I'm going to get two PhDs and four master's degrees when I finish. It was a vision I pursued because I felt something that if I can acquire a lot of capability in my career, that is the propensity that can actually deliver something that not many people can know at the same time. And I said, the accumulation of capability means you can't go to school as an entrepreneur, you can't go to a workshop, or you can also be involved in the ecosystem like we are having in this festival, made possible by Tony Lumelo Foundation. You know, there are so many angles that you can acquire capability. There are so many ways you can accumulate capability. Because uh, the process of accumulation of capability is also very critical because if you do not have that capability, you may not necessarily have the ability to execute that business vision. Because uh, you have seen the friction in the market. But seeing the friction in the market is not just enough. You need to have the capacity to actually enter the market in order to solve that problem that exists in the market. My own, I say I want to run two types of companies. A high-level technology advisory service, and I will own a company that makes electronics. See me here in Nigeria. How are you going to do that? It was a vision I dreamt of. I was finishing as the best graduating student in my class, and unfortunately, there were always jobs. But I didn't really like them. So I came back one day, my vice chancellor, my head of department told me to be said, I've accepted a job for you. I said, sir, I didn't even ask you to accept a job for me. And he said, no, there's so many of them here, and you just have to select one for you. I said, fine. I started that job, two days I left. I resigned. I wanted to go through a process to just learn as much as possible. By the time I was working with my second PhD in the Johns Hopkins University, where I specialize in microelectronics and robotics engineering, I started a company called Fast Micro. That was the first, second semester of my program. You know, I saw an opportunity in the market, and that was the process of accumulation of my capability. I want to just use this experience to illustrate something to you, that most times in life, there are things that cannot just happen without preparation unless you are running a software company where in the night the code is broken and you walk over the night in the morning it works. But if you are building a business of making physical things, most times things don't just work that way. You need to have a process. You need to have a trajectory that you can actually go through in order for you to develop that capacity and ability to make something in the market that market will come for. And I started it, uh, the money, I started it from some fellowships money. I received seven fellowships in the university. And money was everywhere in the beautiful America. So what I was going to do with this money, just I hired 17 graduates in Nigeria remotely from America, and we started Fast Micro. Our major market was actually the military. They needed people to help them design circuit box, and we were the only company, I would say, then in Nigeria was doing that. So we had this opportunity. But I also knew that what we were doing will not take us to the next phase of actually going where the money was. So the accumulation of capability has to move to the next level. Upon graduation, I said, I am going to test that capability. I am going to put it on test to make sure that it is not just enough that I know how to make microprocessors. It's not just enough that I have learned about it in university. I also have to experience how legends and icons in the industry actually produce all these electronic solutions that we use today around the world. I joined a company, and my job was to work where they made the accelerometer that was using the iPhone. 
I was the global lead AC designer of that company. So we designed this awesome technology that we now ship to Apple. But I said, oh, there are so many things you can learn in the industry that a university will not necessarily teach you. I want you to understand that as you plot the frontier, if you plan how to expand the horizon of your business, you need to figure out that there are things necessary, catalytic for you to actually go to learn. And it's so important for you to understand where that knowledge is resident. For me, I knew that in the semiconductor industry, I need to work where they make these things, to understand how they make them. If I want to be among the category king, the people, the leaders, the icons, the catalysts that are going to change the world of the microelectronics. And I worked there. As I was there, they paid a lot of money. They do that in America. Just give you a lot of money for you to stay. And that was the biggest problem, because uh, if there is always a good job, you never really have opportunity to think how to start something. And they keep, they promoted me, and at the time, I say, this is going into a continuum, that I will just stay here one day, they say they have retired me. <laughs> and that's it, and all the whole vision, we go. I said, no, I have learned all I needed to learn to go back to Fast Micro, to run a world-class electronic business. But I have not mastered that necessary element for me to run the top-grade adversary technology service I have dreamt. I said, now I have to go back to university to be a professor. Because um, when I was finishing, I was extreme. I did a very great job. I published papers, books when I was in university, even as a student. So I went to one of the universities, top technical university in the United States. And that was also the time I started writing in Harvard Business Review, where I write regularly to share insights and perspectives and trajectories and models and business systems, how companies can actually redesign themselves, even as technology continues to change the dynamic structures of our global economic architectures, changing people, process, humans, and even nations, interdependent global relationships that we have seen today. And I went, and then I left, I said, I have accumulated the capability, preparing myself for the companies I wanted to run. The next phase is executing that business model. So I now came back to Fast Micro. That is now the phase of execution. The phase of execution is now doing what you have prepared yourself to do as an entrepreneur. And I said, I have to get a mentor. My professor cannot be my business mentor because he knows nothing about business. I respect him when we go into the classroom, writing all those classical things that don't make sense when you text them in the business. <laughs> so I said, who is going to be the one that mentor me? So that was actually, the, I'm very fortunate that I have Mr. Tony Lumelu, someone I can send an email and reply to me. You know, you know, you know, he, you know he, he, he's a legend uh, and he's an icon. And he continues to give. And this, uh, May, 20, May 28, 2015, I came from the United States to Abuja for the inauguration of uh, then President elect Muhammad Buhari. And I heard that he was somewhere in Transcorp for a dinner. I just crashed him. And when I crashed him, I said, Sir, I have this issue. I want you to help me. Because I have solved the technical problem. That was easy. But there was a business model framework. Only people that have experienced such things can actually tell you the best way to go. And within 15 minutes, he explained. Madam, you are there that day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, you know the funny thing? I won't even tell you what he told me, because now he's some intellectual property. <laughs> and I'm also hoping that he has forgotten what he told me. <laughs> because why would I tell you people? You know, I'm an Igbo man. We like containers in Nigeria. <laughs> So, so, so the, the thing there was this. I, I took that idea, I took the clarifications that he gave me, and we went back to create Zemvos. Zemvos is basically a technology that if you put it in the soil, it, it collects information like temperature, moisture, humidity, and the conductivity of that soil, and takes that data through a gateway like satellite, Wi-Fi, GSM, into a cloud server where we have built some computational algorithms to make sense of what is happening at the farm. So instead of...
so, 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 so instead of the farmers, you know, in Africa, we use guest work as a technology. The, the man buys a cow or buys a chicken, depending on the one he can afford. He goes to the ancestors. Some of them were even poor when they died. And then you want to sacrifice the cow, say, give us a bumper harvest. And then you have not changed your farming process, and you are now taking loan to buy a goat for a man that died poor to now make you rich. You know, you cannot be doing the same thing all over again and expect a different result. So this gets works solution we have in Africa has yielded one thing, mass poverty in the community of farmers. And it's extremely unfortunate that you go to farmers and you're telling them, how can we feed you? But the guy is a farmer. And I felt there was an opportunity for that. It was an opportunity that we can redesign the architecture of African agriculture. And we now made Zemvos, which is a category king company. I don't use that word peerless easily, but we are doing something that is changing a beautiful continent. You know, Zemvos has 1,500 people working on it today, and we are generating millions of dollars in revenue. And it's a business I am so excited to share with you. So when we have gone through that process of accumulation of capability, and I went into the execution of that business, but I want to take you into the frontiers, even when you are within that execution level, you need to ask yourself, am I doing the best possible thing I can do in that business? Am I pushing the envelope? Am I taking that business to the next level? Unfortunately, today, there are very few things you can do in order to set a new basis of competition, in order to set a new paradigm for competition to happen in your sector with that technology. Technology is that enabler, is that catalyst, is that engine, is that anchor that can help you leverage and leverage even your competitors. And I challenge you today that when you look at your business, you need to look at two things. How can technology transform what I do? And how can a new business model help me to tap the advantages inherent in that transformation that technology made available? I give you something. You are told in school to solve the needs of your customers. You are told to meet the needs of your customers. But I'm telling you today that if you are focusing on meeting the needs of your customers, you will not be a category king. You will not be a leader in your sector. You are not going to move into the next frontier because the needs of the customers are things already known to the customer and they are not very enough. I thank you that you can move from the needs of the customer to the expectation of the customer. Expectation of the customer is that model where even the customer says, I want more. I give an example. A woman is an environmental activist in Kigali and you are providing her electricity from coal. You have met her need of electricity, but you have not met her expectation of a renewable energy source. So when that kind of problem exists, if somebody comes in tomorrow with solar, that woman automatically says, thank you for your coal. Now someone is coming to meet my needs and my expectation. But that expectation is not even enough. I want you to think how you can meet the perceptions of your customer. These are cases when the customer doesn't even know what he needs or needs. But the day he or she sees that product, they will see that you recall moment and say, I have never dreamed of this, but now I see it, I believe in it. And that was what happened in iPhone. No one saw the iPhone coming. Steve Jobs did not even bother with focus group. He did not even care with surveys. But he said, the day I put it in your hand, you will love it. Because iPhone is a perception product. And I want you to know that for you to move the frontiers in your sector, you need to move from the needs, to this, from the expectation, to the perception, so that you can create a new basis of competition. When you create a new basis of competition, you become disruptive. And that is the moment of glory. And that is absolutely what we need in our beautiful continent. I explain this this way. Whatever you do today, understand one thing. The technology will help you to have what we call productivity gain. It will help you to make things far easier. But most times, that gain can also be a problem if you do not know how to manage it. 
You know that people that embrace the use of ICT have seen a lot of benefits. But people that also embrace internet, sometimes we also see challenges. See like the newspapers today, most of them are finding it very difficult to pay their staff. Because internet has offered all these unbounded, unconstrained distribution channel that makes local newspapers become like global companies, even when they are having more customers, but they can't make more money. So there is a kind of a problem. You can be popular, and yet you are not making money. And that's what I call the diminishing abundance of internet from the lot of diminishing returns. So you can have 1,000 customers and yet no money is coming because you are competing not locally anymore, you are competing internationally. And as you are building a business in the 21st century, understand that that internet construct is going to become a very huge factor as you build your business. It is not every time somebody tells you that internet will make your business grow that it happens. Internet will give you a bigger market, but internet will also give you a very huge competitive challenge. But the key thing here is how do you build that separation, that differentiation that can help you to have an opportunity. In anything you do today, and when you are looking for that new frontier, I always say this, look for your scalable advantage. If you are a barber, we don't have any barber here, of course. Those are small enterprises. These are small companies. But we are startups. That is a difference between a small business and a startup. A startup has an organic living, it's an organic living organism that can scale, that can grow, that can mutate if necessary, transmute itself, that it can just keep growing like a barb of an Iroko tree. But the small business is the guy who is every day, he's doing the same thing. The same person, no, nothing changes. If you do not know how to expand that business, it means your scalable advantage is very low. And that means there is a problem. And as you go through this process, you cannot have that frontier moment until you can figure that thing out. It's very, very important that in the 21st century that our businesses have to see how we can bring an evolutionary moment in everything that we do. Technology is key, but technology is not the only solution. Your business moment is key. And I want to finish this conversation by telling you that one of the best things you can do is to get a mentor. One of the best things you can do is to get a mentor. And I say this thing because uh, you need someone who has tested the market, who has understood the market, who has overcome the challenges of the market to provide the guidance to help you to navigate the challenges which are in the markets. You know, as I explained this, we work from the north, we work from the east, we work from the south, and all across the continent, we are looking for people that will cure the extreme poverty in the land of Africa. And I do believe our generation has this obligation that we can cure extreme hunger in our time. You know, as boys and girls, everyone is looking for that moment. Who are the people that can step forward? We are. And I believe in Africa. The frontiers are wait for us. And you have to see how you can help to unlock it. It will not be easy. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
But what do you see? And I trust that we see an Africa that we all together can make happen. Professor Undubisi Ekwekwe, thank you very much. And indeed, in listening to you, it's interesting, but you may be seated. Sir, so I'm just going to do something very, very quick. Earlier on when I came into the room and they were taking questions and there was a young man seated next to us in the corner there and in earnest, and I watched him and I said, you're not hungry enough to be seen. You're not hungry enough to be heard. What's your question? And he said, well, he thought he would wait till later. But interestingly, I told him, write your question down. And this is what he said. I'm a 2015 alumnus of the TEF program. I have not been lucky to have a reliable mentor. Question for this foundation, therefore, for him today was simply this. How can I have a mentor? How can I find a reliable mentor? Taiwo Ahinaje, where are you? Where are you? All right, do you think, does he look like a possible mentee? <laughs> Africa, put your hands together for the fact that you have mentors. And like I love to say, it's one thing to be a mentor and not a tormentor. But may the mentees not torment the mentors too. Let's once again, let's put our hands together and appreciate him. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And it's time we're going to do some question and answers very quickly for this. So, um, where are you? Okay. Um, I'm going to give this out very quickly because I'm going to make this run with speed in the white, in the red. Please come forward quickly over there. I'll just take seven. You? Uh, he's already running. Um, so in red. If I called you, that's it. Please just come forward. Thank you. Very quickly, very, very quickly. Thank you. All right. So we can just take your questions and your reactions very quick. I'm going to move this with speed. Sweetheart, you are jumping the line. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Victor, and I'm into the agricultural sector. Okay, my question is this. When the prof was speaking, he said something about gaining access to the industries where he could practically learn the things he intended to do. And um, for some of us, we are going into production of things practically too. I don't know if the foundation has a platform where they can link us to firms where we can practically learn things and execute them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam, quickly. My name is Odogene Onome. You found out still at Culinary Academy. I hope to build the first fully automated kitchen in Africa. And my question is, sir, you said breaking the frontiers. And we at Africa were very shy when it comes to automation in the kitchen. They say, how do you want to automate the kitchen? I'm a computer engineer also, but I want to leverage on that. Please, sir, can I get some tutelage from you? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm into fashion. I wanted to ask you, because uh, from all of the uh, testimony that you have given today, we are applauding you for your successes, but we want in clear terms, what were those difficulties you encountered and how you surmounted all of those? All right, now I know we're not writing this down. Let's handle this. Thank you. Yeah. So the first one, basically, uh, I think the internet has uh, many, many resources that anyone that really wants to learn anything today can leverage. But if you are building things in the agricultural space, uh, just let's connect. Uh, there are people that I can easily point you to assist you. Uh, it shouldn't be very difficult because uh, even the Tony Lumelu Foundation has also been working with GE Garage. There are a lot of partnership within this ecosystem that depending on what you are doing, they can always put you to the right direction. Then on the automated uh, kitchen, the first thing I would say here, if you think that there is a market for that, that what people are looking at smart kitchens, how do you automate their kitchens? If there are markets for that and you really believe vividly on that, hey, it's, it's a business to, to go. 
it is all about electronics. Someone has to design it, and somebody has to adapt it and customize it necessarily for the kind of homes we have in Africa. Remember, what they are designing in South Korea in America may not necessarily be relevant here, because in our places here, there may not be light, there may not be energy. So you need to actually evolve what you, where you are thinking. Just connect with me after. I can give you some pointers. Then the challenges I have, yes, everyone has challenges. But necessarily, I don't see them as challenges. I just see them as opportunities that I have to elevate. And when they come, you have to see how do you overcome them. And then when you overcome them, you continue to move. But academically, uh, professionally, I try as much as possible to surround myself with people who can always help me. And I've been very, very lucky to have even people like Mr. Elumelu who can always help me out when there are issues. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. A challenge is an opportunity that I have to elevate. Yes, sir, your question. Yeah. My name is Abu Bakar Rusman. I'm a real estate uh, marketing uh, consultant. Uh, my question is this. How do you stay motivated? You know, every businessman, sometimes in the lifetime of your business, get to get tired, less motivated. So what is that thing that you do? Or what is that thing that you think that keeps you motivated and strong? Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Let me make it snappy. What's the synergy between the idea and the problem? Then the second question, what is, the, how can you conquer your community? Maybe to get your elevator pitch. Thank you. All right. That's a repeat question. I'm sure you heard her earlier on. Okay. So I think the motivation is really, what do I want to achieve? What do I want to become? And what do impact do I want to have in my society? In companies, you have the product, you have the value you want to create in society. I believe vividly that in what I'm doing in agricultural space, until boys and girls can live in this continent and they can afford decent meal, I have not solved, I have not met my, my desire. So that is what drives me. You need to figure out something that inspires you any day you wake up as an entrepreneur. And that thing is what keeps you going, even when there are challenges on the way. And then on the issue of idea and problem, you know, every, in Nigeria, for example, there is no problem in this country somebody does not have an idea. If you go to power, just go to where they drink. People are telling you how they fix all the electricity problem, how they fix, you know, you know, they are all sparks. But at the end of the day, there is no solution. And that is because Africa is an inventive society. We have so much ideas, but we do not have products because we are not an innovation society. We need to transition from an inventive society into an innovation society where we can actually have products in the market. I think I, have, I just wrote something like this in Harvard Business Review a few, few weeks ago, that the transitioning process from invention to innovation is what is going to make it possible that those ideas can become products and services that people can find in the market. So idea is nothing. I want to see products, and only entrepreneurs can actually make that redesign. Thank you. Well, you heard it, and we'll keep here very quickly, and it's a wrap. Thank you. Your name and your question. My name is Odetayo Ailua. My first question is, sir, how were you able to combine entrepreneurship and schooling for your second degree? And then my second question is, you, when, you were, when you were presenting, you talked about perspiration and... My question now is, okay, someone asked a question some days ago saying, what, may, as in, what do you like about big companies, Google, Facebook, and uh, the likes, and Apple? So the person was saying, uh, someone asked, Question and the yeah, question. So the question now is, someone said, he likes Microsoft, which I believe in, that you make product that are necessary. And from your presentation, the solution you have, as in the solution you provide is something that is necessary for the market, which are farmers. So now, like, how do I now make, as in, so where, where do you balance perspiration and making products that are necessary? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Adekunle Oloyede. My question is, during your journey, for you to get to this level, have you ever at one point or the other felt maybe you weren't doing the right thing or it's not the right path? And if yes, at what point did you become so sure that you're doing the right thing and you're not missing it? Fantastic. Thank you. Good day, sir. My name is Michael Rogers from Nigeria, CEO of Nikogo Food. Now, my question is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy how you trash the issue of a mentorship. Because now, as a young farmer, I have a blog 
which is going to be commencing soon, and it's called Swag Farmers. All right, so your question. Now, it is very difficult to really get a mentor because my idea is trying to teach the, the young farmers that you can actually go into farming and still retain your urban oh. lifestyle. Now, these young farm, these uh, older people, they tend to look at you as not being serious. Maybe the way you project yourself. And your right? question, therefore, is? How then do I convince these mentors that are still living in the past that they should buy into my idea of being... All right. They are still living in the past, so you know I've got to fast track you. And this is extremely dangerous. You don't know what side I'm living on. No, you, you're, not giving me, you're not giving me a room to express myself. You, I, I, I promise you, you are expressing I'm yourself. I'm leave that. The second, the second question. The second question. I promise you, you are ex one, you've told us you are a farmer, you are a CEO, you own a blog, you are concerned about mentors who are in the past. Bring us to the present. What is it? I'm your friend. Okay. My, question, my second question is, I want to know your intake on GMO. Is there a way to go? As a, young, as a young farmer, I want to venture into it. As you have seen everything into farming, will you advise me to venture into that part? Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Oh, please applaud him. Appreciate him. GMO. Thank you. I am Taiwo Ahinaje. She presented my case. I'm into education consultancy and support services. My question is, how can you have and maintain a reliable mentor? You know, after the first contact with mentors, they leave you in the lodge. You are on your own. No attention, nothing. The credit I have for my business, no mentor can claim it. I've had an encounter with three mentors. They disappointed me woefully. But I am happy today because you presented my case, and it will be a full pleasure to have him or to hide under his mentorship. It's a good Thank you. Mentors don't want you to hide. They want you to shine. Let's put our hands together. Thank you. So many questions. So, um, on an issue of mentorship, I want you to understand that this is not a kind of a unidirectional process. It has to be bidirectional. I tell you that anyone that mentors me learns something from me. And if you think that any human being will just be feeding you without necessarily getting anything from you, you, are, you have an illusion. So, it is very critical. <coughs> Now, it, is, it is very, very critical that you prepare yourself to also indirectly mentor the mentor. <laughs> then this, this, um, so add value. I mean, what I mean, that add value to the person that is mentoring you. If you do that, the person will be interested in helping you. Now, on GMO, uh, of course, I, I'm not an expert on, on that. But I would say, I still like the organic food. If I go to my village in Abia State, that I will eat. So I really prefer the organic thing. Then on the issue of how have I combined business and, uh, I, you know, I say I'm an evil man. Eh? At the end of the day, it's container. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is this construct of writing papers no one reads in the university. You publish this paper, you are so happy, at the end of the day, no one reads it. Then, then building something that you can actually see that a young girl is getting married, a young man is getting married because that person works in your company. So those things actually inspire me. But there is also something I have learned in the academia. The kind of service we deliver to clients, especially some of the top elite clients, in, CEOs in U.S. that we work, it would not have been possible without that university resume in my CV. So it's a way for you to know how do you position and prepare yourself so that you can actually get ahead? But I don't think it's really, really very difficult. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, did you ever give up? And if you did, what's the final question? Never give up, right? So, I, just believe. That's all I would say. Believe. Believe. That's part of the challenges. Things are getting better. Thank you. Once again, please, a round of applause. Let's appreciate Professor Undebesi Ekwekwe, thank you very much.